Welcome to the Redbeard Embodiment Podcast. I am your host, Alex Green, and I'm on a mission to bring the power of embodiment to people all around the world. In this podcast, we explore how embodiment practices, trauma healing, and knowledge about the human nervous system can help us find our ground, discover new sources of meaning, and create connection in an ever-changing world. The deepest change is it body change. All right. Well, I am super happy to be sitting here with my friend and colleague, Nikki DeSantamour. And Nikki and I are uh, fellow students at the Kelowna Feldenkrais Professional Training Program. Kelowna is a city in central British Columbia, and Feldenkrais is a, is a, a method of somatic education. And so uh, we we met there and we're uh, joining joining hand in hand and in, in uh, uh, learning the method. Nikki is based in uh, San Diego now, although she has been in uh, uh, as we'll hear her, she has global influences due to uh, growing up in many different parts of the world. Uh, but I thought it would be awesome, Nikki, just to sit down and have a conversation around. Um, what drew us into Feldenkrais and some of the things that we are uh, learning and coming alive for us as we explore. But then as I've gotten to know you, you're just your own. I'm always interested in people's stories that have led them into embodiment work. Um, okay. uh, and and I think of you as having a, a unique and interesting path. And so I just love to chat about all of those things today. It's a pleasure to be here, Alex. And coming and talking about this this work that we're in and in in the realm of somatics and human development so for me my journey was very much centered around uh movement i've been teaching movement for over 10 years different methods i've taught yoga and was very much more interested in yoga. Anything mind-body was very much of interest to me. Mm. Um, and along the years, I've tried to implement more of a sense of introceptive practice throughout. For me, that was very important in, in movement and how I felt I got to know myself better, and particularly in those formative years in my well, I felt in my late teens and early 20s and and I had done a training in yoga. But how I actually came into that was that I was also working as a tea consultant. So a lot of mm. Eastern practice influenced me and in, in, into that realm of uh, yeah. to, to movement. Well, yeah. So so take us back in time a little bit. So <laughs> so I. um I don't even remember all the, you know, you, you were kind of an international mm -hmm. student. At some point you arrived in New York, maybe in your mm -hmm. late teens, something like that. Is that when you're, is that when your sort of yoga and embodiment journey began or were there some roots of that uh, in your childhood or mm -hmm. uh, how did that? Yeah. Yeah. So, it, you know, I, grew up, I, my mother's from Mozambique, my dad is American and worked in NGO work. So we lived three, four years in many different countries, particularly in the African continent. Mm. And so I felt that kind of upbringing um, created a quality of adaptability in me and also being able to see many different ways of living and many different ways of life. Um, and mm. And so, but maybe there's, of course, the, you know, this kind of moving and adapting and all of this probably didn't give me as much grounding as needed in, in formative years. I, mm. So it was really, I had gone to, I lived, moved to New York around the age of eight after living in Haiti mm -hmm. and left New York around 15, back to the African continent and finished mm. school there. And, and after graduating, continued to move around and explore. And, and I was uh, studying at the uh, 
Academy of Arts in San Francisco, but left that um, and felt that I wanted to go into movement. Um, I'd been living in Dominican Republic and I was surfing and doing Pilates. And I mean, to, to sense myself in this way, to use myself in this way, I wasn't really quite sure what I was onto, but it, it felt that there was some part of me that in a way had had a structure when I never really thought about that kind of thing before. And I had gone back to New York, maybe around the age of 22. And I was starting to work in, in tea. And that was also very interesting to me. Um, so and, what is a tea consultant? Is it um, somebody who sells tea? Yes. Finds yes, tea. new tea? What, what's yes. the life of and, a tea consultant like? Yeah. So, so I tried many different types of tea, all of from, you know, Japan to China to India and, and 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 for me, the natural world is it is is just as important to me in my in my what I find valuable in in living. Mm. I felt tea and is in a way a, a process of taking this quiet time or moment to reflect, and you see that in tea ceremony and and all mm. of this. Mm. Um, really got into the Tao Te Ching and this kind of art of living. So this kind of started to emerge in my my thinking that there is a kind of art to living and being. Mm. Um, I then started to embark on yoga and felt much more this mind-body stuff and mm. continued on with that and later became trained in yoga. But as I as I went on, I just felt that so many studios I tried to work with were more interested in just some kind of illuminated sequencing and postures rather than the how. Mm -hmm. I was always very interested in the how. So I wasn't necessarily such a good fit for many studios because it was very much the time of power yoga and vinyasa and all of this kind of stuff. Were, that, that wasn't your jam that was not my jam mm. and uh i had later gone into working more gymnastic style movements which is interesting in one's late 20s to go there and and building that kind of practice more of the Edo portal work kind of stuff which is all locomotive and it's so it's almost interesting that I ended up uh, doing Feldenkrais work because maybe the Ido Portal stuff gave me a little bit more of this just kind of dynamic understanding of movement and how. But of course, that work can also be very, in a way, oh, I got this many muscle ups or I'm acquiring this kind of right. skill set and I place value in this, which gold me, a little bit gold driven very gold driven and it was still yeah. something i was not very interesting interested in 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 a way like i want to be of service if i'm only showing people i have this kind of skill set or i have this kind of handstand then it doesn't really benefit anyone i think we see a lot of accounts like that on on Instagram, Instagram yeah, yeah, yeah it's just like human that's what tricks. that's what half of my uh, reels on on Facebook yeah. and Instagram. I sort of like some of them, you know. Yeah. I see some, I see some amazing feats, but yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, human beings are amazing, and we do all these interesting things. But it's like, it, it, it's it's just so. I mean, I find the the Feldenkrais method so profound in the sense that it's so inclusive to everyone. Mm -hmm. It was really in the beginning of the COVID period. I had been working with um, Lavinia Plonka and I found her uh, workshop on the Shift Network. And the title was something like Reset Your Nervous System in Seven Weeks. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was like, that sounds good because I actually, throughout my um, 20s, I had... Yeah, did you need a, a nervous system reset? 
I Were did. Jones and for a Jones and for a reset. <laughs> yeah, I was Jones and for a reset. And you know how life in New York can be. It's very mm. you're on go go all the time, right? It's like sure. really like such your nervous system is very full. Like and so I had also experienced uh, throughout my years uh, anxiety and that was brought on by vertigo. So I was having some vestibular challenges. And at, this was at the time I was teaching in Morocco and Casablanca mm -hmm. where these symptoms started to really um, like become quite chronic in a way. And um, so I had, found an acupuncturist i was working with an osteopath there and it helped it helped the symptoms mm. um but at the end of the day there was something habitual about how my system was working and creating these reactions that it became almost like a panic disorder when the vertigo came on i see so yeah so um and, you know, so I continued on with this kind of acupuncture and osteopathy and things for better, but it still was, I could still sense that there was something in my nervous system that needed addressing. Um, mm. So when I saw that language for the Feldenkrais method, I was very interested in, in what that could look like. Um, what was What was the language? I mean, so... So you're right. I mean, Feldenkrais yeah. is definitely nervous system work. Are, yeah. are you talking about that that seven week reset? Was mm -hmm. that Feldenkrais based? Yes. Okay, I see. I see. Yes, and so I was like, I okay. I almost thought this was always nervous system, but I never closely looked so much at the nervous system. Okay. As as a as a means to change change the system or way of being the body and sensation yes. and yeah. yes and it was really within one lesson i could sense a total difference within how i sensed my nervous system i almost didn't know it was possible hmm. so I, I was very interested in the work um and by the end of the seven weeks i could sense profound shifts in myself and I didn't give much thought to awareness or what attention could be. You know, I think we've been taught that awareness or this kind of thing is cultivated through sitting down and, and meditating and trying to find this kind of state of mind. Sure. Where this is a very tangible, concrete process to get to awareness. Yep. I, through through movement yeah through movement yeah so it was very very fascinating I, I knew right away this is what i want to be doing wow so so you got the reset the seven weeks you i got i got the reset in seven weeks and you know in times before that like i said i was i was working i did classes with tom myers i was getting very interested in gait and structure and posture mm -hmm. and then i went on to study with Judith Aston a little bit and also more gate stuff. But again, like a lot of the stuff could feel maybe to me a little prescriptive, right? Sure. And we're, you know, as we talked in a way that I have to also address my emotional life. I also have to address the emotional life to also bring about changes that... Mm. So that got you hooked. You said that was the beginning of the pandemic. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes. and it wasn't soon. I mean, when did we begin our Kelowna training? Wasn't it in summer of 2020? Or I fall? Or no, maybe it was 20, January 20, 2021. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So a year later, um, Lavinia announces, oh, there's a training in Kelowna, Canada. Um, it's by... Uh, the edu educational director is Julie Peck. I mm. highly recommend. And <laughs> and yeah. and I was like, dude, I want I want to go for this. And she's like, are you sure? It's a huge commitment. And and I knew it, it, it's like 
I just know. And there is something there. I'm like, I've been a movement person, but there's something about this, that this is what I want. This is how I want to be of service, not teaching someone some kind of handstand. To do or, a handstand. Yeah. Or do which is all muscle great. Ups. Yeah. 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 But there's something here that could go and form your handstand, could go and form your run, but is even more practical to how it is I live my life. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. Well, let's, um, why don't we, let's kind of riff on, let's, so, I mean, to me, Feldenkrais is such an interesting modality because, um, you know, like you, I'm somebody who's studied and trained in a number mm-hmm. of other things. And um, Feldenkrais is, it's a funny one to explain because to me, there's so much included in it. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, it's a system of movement therapy. Um, but yes, it's just, but, but, but it's more than that. Felden, you know, Moshe Feldenkrais was a scientist. He was a okay. philosopher. Um, and, you know, part of where you and I have connected has been on, you know, the, the more that can okay. arise from uh, refining awareness of the body and the nervous system, uh, et cetera. And we have, we can we have to remember to talk about Alexander Lowen's books, by the way. Yes, we have to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the sidebar that we'll come back yeah. to that. Um, but yeah, like, uh, I don't know. Why don't we just talk a little bit? Cause you know, part of it is for, you know, some of, some of our listeners will mm-hmm. maybe have heard of Feldenkrais, but not know exactly uh, what's in it. Um, you, you know, you've started to offer workshops. I'm going to be starting to offer workshops. Maybe mm-hmm. we'll collaborate on a workshop. So we yeah. may as well sort of lay use, let's sort of lay the foundation of, um, mm. you know, what, you know, what are some of the basic w- ingredients that uh, add up to the Feldenkrais method? And mm-hmm. we'll, we'll just do some back and forth maybe, but I'll, we'll, I'll throw the baton to you. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, there's so many different ways, right? When people are like, well, it's Feldenkrais method. You right. know, there's there's two, two parts to the method. There's awareness through movement, which is the kind of group class uh, movement part of the method. And then there's um, where you can work privately one-on-one in, in the realm of functional integration with the practitioner. Mm. Both... Um, it both offer, I, and I think particularly what's happening is, or what's so profoundly different in the Feldenkrais method is that we're deeply interested in the sensory experience. And that sensory experience can rewire the brain. And it's it's through this kind of, oh, that learning, Moshe was very interested in learning. He said, oh, I chose movement but I could do this with math. I could do this with other things, but mm-hmm. that the nervous system best learns through movement, right? Those mm-hmm. like most crucial learning years are in the early developmental years. Mm-hmm. So he uses movement um, and, and through this, the sensory experience, what's happening, I think also what makes to me Feldenkrais teaching an art that one refines continually is that we're helping the person or facilitating the person to become more specific in their experience by asking questions Mm -hmm. that kind of spark the curiosity. You know, we're working with the prefrontal cortex of the brain, the part that's curious. Mm -hmm. Totally. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So so I'm just going to (laughs) <laughs> uh, add my two cents to what yeah. we've already shared. So, mm-hmm. okay, let me just think for a second. So, yeah, so so I agree. So one thing that really stands out is that it's a learning paradigm mm-hmm. rather than a, a fixing paradigm. So even though, you know, that, you know, it's, you know, it has results, a tangible neurophysiological change, mm-hmm. but unlike, let's say, I mean, lots of things say that they are teaching rather than doing like in mm-hmm. rolfing structural structural mm-hmm. integration mm-hmm. you know any any good structural integrationist would say i'm i'm teaching the body and the nervous system how to mm-hmm. be in a new form but true but that's only half true you're also sort of like you know manipulating the fashion you're using, bringing it there yeah you're bringing it there so so yeah. 
Um, and certainly clients perceive it as, hey, could you please get my posture corrected, mm -hmm. whether that's through rolfing, whether that's mm -hmm. through chiropractic. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know how the body works? Please manipulate my body. Hopefully mm -hmm. that will stay. Um, so that's sort of like what I call the, you know, fixing mindset, which, you know, mm -hmm. is pretty, is pretty prevalent. We could have yes. that in, in yoga or all kinds of things mm -hmm. as well. But, but, but Feldenkrais really chose a learning paradigm. Mm -hmm. And exactly as you say, this, uh, the, the, the best learners or the, mm -hmm. or the most vigorous phase of learning is, is mm -hmm. infant and child development when mm -hmm. the brain is just going crazy with uh, neuronal mm -hmm. development and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. so it's like, he got really interested in what are the conditions for that optimized learning in yes. the in the, in the neurological sense of the yes. word, mm -hmm. and so there are the so the things that are unique are things like um, slowing things way down, mm -hmm. taking the um, taking the the you know taking a goal off the table, and mm -hmm. exactly what you said, the questions that the mm -hmm. you know a Feldenkrais teacher is inviting you to mm -hmm. reflect mm -hmm. as you're exploring those questions. Mm -hmm keep you in a learning mindset rather than a pushing yes. or, or whatever it is. And the, and the word you, well, you said, I think the sensory awareness mm. and, and sometimes Moshe says, um, you know, the kinesthetic feeling mm -hmm. of movement to me is such a, is another just massive piece of it. It's not just that we're moving. If you move mm -hmm. so many times, it will, you know, lubricate your synovial joints mm -hmm. or mobilize. It's, it's not that it's yeah. that you have to be there while the movement is happening with your yes. appreciation. Does this feel more pleasurable? Am I, mm -hmm. am I creating more of a sense of ease? Mm -hmm. Why is this a little sticky? Like the, that sort of ever present curious awareness, yes. I think to me is an essential ingredient uh, uh, of it, but so, so anyway, so those are, so, so, what, 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 what Absolutely. else? Yeah. 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 The, the curiosity, yeah. The curiosity part. And it's almost like, right. These, these questions that, you know, I remember in the beginning, I'm like, ah, oh, my mind wanders, mm, mm. you know, I, 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 I noticed my, I never really gave much thought to attention, right? It's like we have to also make the distinction between, well, and, and Krishnamurti makes this distinction in, in Life Ahead, the, mm. and Julie loves this quote, and it, it's actually what brought me to a lot to looking into Krishnamurti. Of course, Feldenkrais was the big- Well, I was gonna ask about that too. So yeah, yeah. We'll, get to, we'll, get, we'll get to Krishnamurti as well, yeah. Yeah, so he makes the distinction between concentration and attention. Okay. That concentration is almost like within this box and okay. attention is expansive, right? So, you know, for me, like, oh, we've always been told to concentrate in school, but we, but the, I don't think we've really explored what attention could be. Mm. And so I'm there like, oh, I, my attention in a way, it drifts. Mm. So I started to find as I pay more attention, there's this quality of aliveness that feels profoundly human in my experience. I could sense myself. Mm. And these questions also begin to arise. Like, how do I feel my spine? Or how did I do that? Am I doing that with my shoulder? Am I that I become more ex like specific in my experiencing of myself that I could attend to what my actual visual patterns are, that mm. when stress or when difficulty arise, I don't contract, that we do these things to shorten ourselves all the time and, and not even know it. And Jeff mm -hmm. Haller uses biological fitness, which I love so much that idea, but there's something innate within, within us, some kind of innate composure that we can go back to mm. that is, is viable in, in our experience that there is a quality of resiliency, which to me makes this method absolutely profound, that we have this rich inner resource we can go back to. Yeah. Well, and I think that, um, and I love your description of that that process of well two things i love in that mm -hmm. that nice comment there one is about the you know 
learning the, the the attributes and the dimensions of attention, you know, is such mm. a valuable strength of the of the mm-hmm. of the method. It, the mm. attention is not one thing. There's different forms of it. Um, but all, but this also this idea that uh, that part of the self awareness that arises in Feldenkrais method is. Well, I guess the word we most often use is is image, right? So image referring yes. to your sort of conceptual construct of, of who you are and your embodiment and what's going on. And you you gave a nice description of uh, if you slow down and you and you st- and you pay attention in a in a in a detailed way in a consistent way over time, you're starting to perceive at a level that's not that that's not the the original habit Mm -hmm. so starting to observe when i do this uh when i step uh what's my shoulder blade doing Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. which direction does my head slightly turn Mm -hmm. what's happening with my breath and i think in the beginning you know at least when i've taught some people and Mm -hmm. and i've had this feeling myself it almost feels a little bit like oh come on like uh this is getting a little too granular um (laughs) <laughs> uh, like, why are we hi- hyper fixating on what yeah. our rib cage is doing or that yeah. our breath went a little bit out, mm. but, but if you stay with it soon enough, you realize that that opens a doorway into a, a greatly expanded, it's not just self-awareness of how your, mm. uh, entire structure system is organizing and participating, but somehow that becomes the gateway for things getting more coordinated, more yes. elegant and easeful, yeah. doing less of something unnecessary. So I, I think of it as a refinement uh, kind of a paradigm as well. Absolutely. Yes, I feel this. You know, it's funny because we'll go away to a training session in Canada and usually I don't do much in, of anything else besides, you know, what we're doing in the, in the training hall. So, right. and, and, and I primarily do jujitsu nowadays and 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 you know feldenkrais himself was a judo black belt Mm. so the method was very much inspired by by judo and infant movement so i find it to be such an interesting relationship with jujitsu so i'll go away and then i'll come back home and and train and things are you know you would think oh i haven't trained in three weeks but i come back and i'm like wow something is even more refined, something is even more elegant in my experiencing, or there's even more of a quality attention. And, and I could sense this, right, there's like this relationship, even what's happening in functional integration, if we really tap into it, is it's this, you know, thinking not in words, and we're having this communication with two nervous systems, Mm. And, and, and that's also what's happening in jujitsu, you know, and the more we become m- more in tuned with this deep listening within ourselves, which is what's happening throughout the process of the method, the more we can better relate to ourselves in, in, in the environment, right? So that, so that kind of is, the, as we were talking about, um, I think in the last segment, we were speaking a lot about functionality. Mm. Hmm. One thing I wanted to touch upon was, you know, some of what drew me into the work. Well, you know, I had heard of it, it was on my radar when I when I studied structural integration uh-huh. in the way that I did. The the founder of that style had also studied with Moshe, and so you know, I started sto- reading. Okay, good. All right, you got it. Yeah, great. I- <laughs> yeah. So he this yeah double E. He was a wild yeah. and crazy Mormon. Business yes, fascinating turned, individual. Turned turned Rolfer, uh, uh, Feldenkrais person, and then later a Zen Zen guy. So interesting mm. life life story. Mm-hmm. But um, so you know, so so on my radar through that, but not a sort of a deep dive. But somehow I got. Um, I think it was you know I the thing that really brought me back to it was uh, Norman Doidge's book. Um, mm-hmm. What is it? The Brain's Way of Healing. I think is, mm-hmm. is what it's called. And there's two chapters in there on the Felder, about neuroplasticity because yes. it wasn't known for sure at the time. I mean, Moshe mm-hmm. Feldenkrais very much ahead of his time in the sense that yes. he his hypothesis was that our our neuromuscular system learns in a particular way, mm-hmm. uh, and and that uh, but 
at that time, this, the belief system physiologists still neurophysiologists still believed that our brain was essentially fixed by the time we were, I don't know, 16, 18, 22, something like that. And we had very little neuroplasticity, but of course the, the, you know, emerging science has, has really validated that, you know, mm -hmm. we, we retain neuroplasticity to just a tremendous degree, um, yes. much more, more than previously thought. So anyway, um, so, so in Norman Deutsch's book, there's a couple of chapters and it's about how Feldenkrais method has been shown to just be super mm -hmm. effective uh, by, by modern standards. Mm -hmm. but, he, but he starts one of the chapters with, with an anecdote about Moshe's life that was so fascinating to mm -hmm. me that it led me to sort of re take a look at some of his books. And the anecdote was that, you know, he grew up in, in Nazi occupied, I think, Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, Jewish, Jewish family, uh, uh, Orthodox education. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but for some reason, when he was a teenager, 13, 14, somewhere around there, uh, he knew he needed to leave. Like he had heard of, so, so, uh, mm -hmm. Israel wasn't sort of fully defined as a state, mm -hmm. but it was sort of, there was early, uh, pine, you know, sort of, it was mm -hmm. kind of being yes, yes. Pi pioneered. Mm -hmm. So when he was 13, he packed a bag, he mm -hmm. took his math textbooks because he was a you know a mathematician. Yeah. Uh, a pistol, and he started walking to to Israel, mm -hmm. and it took I can't remember six nine months something like yes. that. Mm -hmm. So 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 he walked to Israel, left his family, and along the way, attracted a little uh, a a collection of a, more than a hundred youth. So he kind of started yes. this sort of youth movement. Mm -hmm. And they all ended up in in Israel and they were mm -hmm. sort of sort of and he worked in manual labor. There's a lot mm -hmm. of construction, all of that. Um, uh, but to me, there was just something really fascinating about that origin story. Mm -hmm. uh, what what an unusual um, situation, not only to do that, but mm -hmm. even just th think about the charisma to yes. sort of get other people to say, yeah, this is this is what. Um, uh, this is what we should be doing. But, but then, then when I looked closely, I mean, just what a fascinating character, because here he is a scientist, you know, physicist, he's, he's doing work with Marie Curie and, and, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff, but, and he's, uh, and somehow he met, you know, Jigoro Kano, the, the yes. judo guy. And, and he, he, and even before that, he had developed some of his own, um, uh, sort of self-defense systems, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so all these sort of threads coming together, you know, it's such a fascinating life story. But then in his, in his works, mm -hmm. what I really appreciate is, is not only the, um, the, well, the tangibility of his method, you know, Julie, our, yeah. our teacher always makes the comment part of Feldenkrais's gift mm -hmm. was to do a sort of a deep learning around, you know, the cutting edge neuro, uh, neurophysiology stuff about the eyes, stuff about the yes. vestibular system, but his gift mm -hmm. was to take abstract things and then, and then create lessons, what's called awareness through movement lessons in our work mm -hmm. that, that practically engage that. Um, mm -hmm. And so how to take the abstract, bring it into something experiential um, so I love that dimension, the mm -hmm. sort of really practical side of it, and it mm -hmm. works. The, but, but also the sort of his philosophical bent, his yes. questions about what it means to, to what it means to learn, what it means to to, and, and as you said earlier, uh, you know, he he wanted to teach something, and he could have taught it in other ways through mm -hmm. art, perhaps, mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. But he used movement as his medium. Yes. Yeah, and, and I and I and I think it's important. This you know we say awareness through movement. That's mm. the name of Feldenkrais lessons. And I sometimes like to remind myself that it's, you know, I get a little bit stuck on the movements when I'm trying to do something I can't do all very well. Mm -hmm. But then I'm what I'm what I'm reminded of is that it's what am I trying to learn? I'm trying to learn awareness via movement. I'm not trying mm. to learn movement through awareness. I'm yes. trying to get awareness through movement. So so. Yeah. <laughs> to me, it's just sort of one of these these areas where it takes me into a deeper place. And yes. similar to like you, when I in my when I studied martial arts, it wasn't so that I could defend myself. There was some higher principle I was trying to grasp. 
Mm-hmm. So, so what, what, what about you when you kind of think so that there's the, you know, there's the feeling better in your body mm-hmm. getting, more, but, but then there's that something more, how do, how do you think about that? Um, I've been loving this quote by Fritz Perls that awareness alone can be curative. And it's, it's, it's simply that, right? Like you're saying, it's like, okay, we're, it's not that the movements have to be like performed to perfection or this, but it's, it's, it's simply the vehicle to, to take us into awareness. And it's about getting more and more specific in your, in your process of how it is you would tend to yourself. And I think, you know, I, there's very little today that actually offers that kind of exquisite experience of attending to yourself in that way Mm. to me. And, and to me that then kind of, well, hopefully it then extends into your living, right? Because it's all self-relational. Um, and self-use and, yeah the self-use that it it makes you know i i mean it's an art i think this is an art it's <laughs> well it's, said well said yeah it's an art you know and um and you know as we I, I think, you know, in the time that Feldenkrais was there, along with his contemporaries of like Rolf and Alexander Technique and these different people that I believe it was coming after the World Wars where people were very much exper- interested in the human experience. Mm. And during this time, we had Sig- Sigmund Freud's book, Ego and ID. And, and then there was Feldenkrais talking about like, well, with with his book, you know, body immature behavior, but in a way that he was telling Sigmund Freud that his ideas were a bit limited in, yeah. in the to to go to a person, and I believe Ida Rolf um, had the same sentiment as well that if you change the structure of the person, the mm-hmm. thinking can go along with it, the the feeling, sensing, all of this can go along with it. Um, and so I, I think that to me is the most potent part of these kind of practices and particularly Feldenkrais method that everything else can go, go, but it's, it's a very kind way. It's a very kind way to get there. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like, um, I mean, I'm thinking about that era with, Mm -hmm. I mean, Freud was a little bit a little bit earlier, but not much, yeah. but this era of Ida Rolf and Fritz Perls and yeah. Moshe, um, you know, Erickson, you know, these people mm-hmm. hanging around, you know, everybody meeting up at Esalen in California yeah. and, and uh, sharing ideas, and, you know, yeah. uh, magic uh, time. Yeah. We, we owe a lot to that, that era of, uh, of exploration, I guess, you know, the human potential movement as it's, yes. as, as it's sometimes called. Um, so you were just in London mm-hmm. and, and I think you went, you went to what Krishnamurti's home or a school or. Yes. What I, was went to, <laughs> I went to Brockwood park. So okay. they had dedicated a, a school where children can go study in the, in the realm of experiential learning, which is Brockwood park. Highly okay. recommend anyone bring their child there. It is an amazing place. They're doing wonderful things. So it's still, they still does that. It's a, still a boarding school. I see. Um, fat, it, and it's, you know, in the English countryside, very scenic, very peaceful. Mm. Um, and then, and so there's the boarding school, Brockwood Park, and then there's the Krishnamurti Center. Uh, where one could go and just spend time contemplative way just being Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and study the teachings of Krishnamurti. So this is the first time, particularly after the COVID era, that they offered this retreat for young adults, which was so popular, they'll be doing more of it because they just, in a way, in the last, I think, year or two, started to bring their presence more to uh, the social media platforms of Instagram and 
YouTube. So now I think there's a lot more young people um, very interested in this work. Of- well, so so Krishnamurti is sort of roughly on my radar, but not um, not in a huge way. Can you just summarize just a little bit about his his thinking and his his impact on the you know yes. the world the world of meditation yes. consciousness mm-hmm. his his mm-hmm. kind of contribution? Oh yes, so he he was a philosopher um, mm-hmm. in the Theosophist Society. They had found him and said, "We'll take." He, he was maybe 14 at the time, come with us, we're going to breed you to become this great theosophist, um, the, actually the leader. Mm. And he, years later, he denounces this kind of title and this position, society kind of crumbles from that. But they right. had given him the house in Ojai, and um, I think maybe the center also kind of came for that there's a place for children could learn in this kind of way. But he mm. denounces this title because he was very interested in inclusivity, that everyone had access, that it wasn't just the theosophists, like not people just in the circle that had access to this kind of, oh, you know, discussions and uh, knowledge. And he also really denounced. And is it is it medit is is there a meditation piece? No, there's absolutely no meditation. Okay, so I he see. actually, in a way, didn't. His talks on meditation are absolutely fascinating. I'll send you them. But he mm. he's not interested in meditation. He's okay. not interested in anything with any kind of accumulated knowledge. He believes that once there's accumulated knowledge learning ends stops yeah stops and so it's very interesting because when this um retreat was offered and i'm on this retreat with like these young people from all over and and it's fast and it's it's very nice to be with them and have these discussions but some of them where i felt that there was a gap and i was always the person because we'd had dialogue at the end of the day oh you were that person good yeah (laughs) but you know everyone would be like but if the observer, and they would have these really big questions about the human condition and and be in quite a dual duality state, Mm -hmm. but none of them were rooted in experience. Mm -hmm. They were simply in this cognitive thinking that didn't really go anywhere. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, if you read the pamphlet, there are no answers. You're simply here to just, there's no accumulated knowledge that comes here. This mm. is a this is a place to just simply listen. Mm. And, and, and that's distinctly what he says, is that what is the process of retreat? That you could lose your heritage, you could for a, a moment lose who it is you think you are in the world, your family, X, Y, Z, and, and, and simply be in a place of quiet mm. to just listen. So he was very interested in order in beauty so like the whole place is just the landscape is fantastic and there's so much natural beauty so he believed that was really also an important part to 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 learning so his big thing was was learning and Mm -hmm. and the conditions that kind of cultivated that but in a way learning that as feldenkrais believed was ever evolving and never and and yeah, and not uh, yet yeah, open ended. And open ended. Yeah. So yeah. all of his discussions, he'll emphasize on the point that he calls himself the speaker, but he says, question the speaker. I'm not here to, to tell you anything. I'm not here to be prescriptive. I'm simply here to raise the questions. We're here as a society raising the questions. And that as soon as we have a sense of, who we are or like what we think we are religion xyz this is better Mm -hmm. than that then we've Mm -hmm. created division in the world and this is where all our human suffering comes from difficulties arise yeah Yeah. exactly so it was a it was an interesting time and maybe some have an idea of this i mean and some don't i think even you know uh we, we we find that it's up to us to to in a way keep our thinking expand because it's like once there's the idea of i i went to the krishna murti retreat i feel peaceful i i learned how to you got something i got something right and that's what we're all used to 
because mm. that's what we went to school thinking. I mean, most of us went to yeah, these. You got schools. your degree. You learned yes. something. Yeah, yeah, etc. Yeah. And and it it doesn't actually serve us in any way. So it's going back to this curiosity and this expanded way that that learning is. I love that. So so compatible with 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 mm -hmm. Feldenkrais. I didn't. Now I'm seeing the connection much more yes. much more clearly. Do you know if did they know one another? I believe they did. Yes, and okay. and I think in elusive obvious he he mentions Krishnamurti as well. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'll look mm -hmm. that up. Mm -hmm. Well, so speaking of it, so while you were there, you did your your retreat, which sounds mm -hmm. like it was cool and useful. Very and cool. You're, yeah. And you're still on the path. Uh -huh. Um. And then I think you, you did a workshop and I liked your title. Didn't you call it an elusive kind of grace? I right? did. A Felden, yeah. Feldenkrais workshop, which yeah. I, I liked this sort of the nod to one of uh, uh, Moshe's, uh, I think it was his, was it his last book? The Elusive Obvious? Yes. I Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. How did that go? It went great. Um, I, I did it in a private residence. It was a very beautiful residence, my friend Rami's house. And it's it's just two small groups. So six mm. people in the morning, six people in the afternoon. Mm. Um, and I taught the seventh cervical from Man Ranch. And then I also taught um, the hand to heal lesson. I, I chose those lessons because, I mean, there was something in these lessons that I feel you know, at, at the end of a lesson, there's a really, and sometimes lessons like these, where you feel yourself very tall, mm. can can have like a real shock to people that they, oh, I, I never sensed that in me before. What is that, the seventh cervical? Or, and, and so they walk around and they're very much in shock. Oh, well, what is this? It's elusive. It's kind of graceful. After and then hand to heel gave gave them a sense of dimensionality and moving from this place and how one side could just, all of this you know that there's there's so many different tastes to different lessons and they were the two were quite different in, mm. in the experience and you know I it, it's you know for a lot of the time I have people that have maybe heard but never have experienced a lesson or never even heard of it before mm -hmm. and and uh yeah I, I i could tell it's it's a very my job or my 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 interest is really facilitating that kind of quality for them to get in a way put aside what they think of uh but that they've taken from other kind of classes that they go to the end limit and, and bring mm -hmm. them more back to, well, do you like the quality of your movement? Right. Right. Yeah. Always a good question. Do you, yeah. Does it feel good? Do you like, are it? you enjoying yourself? And, Can you yeah, find how to do that? Quality, quality, always yeah. a good word to lean into. Mm -hmm. So, so I have a curiosity for you. So, you know, we're, Hopefully, God willing, we are um, what less than a year. I, mm -hmm. I I sort of have this love hate relationship with uh, the Feldenkrais professional training because it's really long. It's four years, and and we spend a lot of time. And um, the love part is yeah. that well, there's a lot of the well, the hate part is that you know it's a lot of travel and and mm -hmm. um, yeah and, yeah. And that. But but the love part is 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 that you know that's a lot of time for a lot to unfold. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, where the end is in sight. So that's mm -hmm. fun for us. So, so where I'm curious is, you know, with your background, you know, and I also know you travel in the uh, mm -hmm. art circles, you know, partly, mm -hmm. partly in connection with your sister, mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, you told me about me, I don't know if you're still affiliated with the uh, hardcore punk scene mm -hmm. in New York, but anyway, I, you know, you've, you've mm -hmm. had a, an inter a varied and interesting path, different communities where and then certainly you know the 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 brazilian jiu-jitsu and, mm -hmm. and a lot of the other movement and somatic work where where are you hoping to go with this what who are who are you wanting to work with where do you see this going uh you know in your own teaching mm. yeah you know i i hear this sometimes that you need to it, you need to drive into your demographic um 
We're in a sense that I feel that I'm happy to work with many different people, um, but definitely who I've been working with in the last years have definitely been artists, people that work with their hands, painters, um, people that do clay, sculptors. So that's definitely definitely been who I, I work with and continues to gravitate towards me. And um, so de definitely creatives. I, I work with creatives. And, and to me, this work and creativity are hand in hand. In a way, even if I was working with an office demographic, I'd still be very interested in them finding what it means to be creative. I, again, I think this is so related to the art of living. Um, mm. and, and so that, that that creativity becomes something that is, is in a way moment by moment that they can find that there's something different in, in, in the experience of themselves. So, you know, I, I, will continue facilitating and evolving group classes. And I think at the same time, it will be more of the same type of people, but I'd be very much interested in seeing who else comes to the door. But again, I have the, the projects I'm working on, um, Dynamic Posture for Artists and working on that book will also strengthen in that my understanding of what it means to the self-use of, of an artist. Sure, sure. And interpreting that and facilitating that something could be easier in their process. But again, everything is like, I could do this with carpenters or, you know. Yeah. It, Gar it, gardeners. Gardeners, gardeners. Yeah. yeah. Like I like to garden, I do that quite a bit. Gardens <laughs> gone so, gardening has gone so easy for me. Yeah. I, I can feel that now that there's, there's definitely something different. So mm. I like to, to, to play around and um it, it's for me I, I connect with many different people as you said I have I've been around different scenes I could do it with Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and 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 that as well so I'm passionate mm -hmm. about many things and and can see myself bringing this kind of work to different people yeah yeah well and, and I'm remembering one of an earlier conversation we had and, and um, where you were, uh, where it was, it was, it, you're kind of giving me a window into a little bit of a, um, you know, that some of your interest, if, and I'm just going to summarize, and then you're going to, you're going to correct mm -hmm. anything I miss, but that some of your, that you've a little bit had this life, lifelong or from young days interest in sort of, you've, you've said it a few times here today, you know, sort of the art of living, mm -hmm. but also sort of like the art of living a whole lifespan, the art of mm -hmm. the art, the art of being young, the art of being uh, in one's middle years, the art mm -hmm. of the, the mm -hmm. art of aging, the, the art of dying. Yes. Um, and you, you know, and, and there's some movement I had never heard of it, but you said like the centenarian movement and yeah. or something like yes. I, which longevity, and then you, you you were sharing something so interesting. I can't remember what it was. Something about, I don't know if it was like people in Greece and they're walking up hills or something. But anyway, this has been an yes. interest of yours. This idea of living gracefully during a whole mm -hmm. lifespan. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. And, you know, I think a lot of, it, it has been my interest for a long time, but I also feel that it got even more of, to me, a, a subject of interest through bioenergetic work, a lot of the work of, of Alexander, Lowen. Alexander Lowen. Lowen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and th to me, the bioenergetic work that, that we can find ourselves it, it, throughout our formative years in, in different stages of our living and bring that in without resistance. You know, in the West, we're very much interested in alpha stage of living that were only useful in our alpha years and and we can know we can't know ourselves and what is what is so uh, that's a new term for me so what what is the alpha stage of living i would say alpha stage of living when do people almost that i think it's really maybe into your 40s like when does the midlife crisis come like probably yeah, around then that people there. start to be yeah. like i don't you know i got the money i got the job i got the house i got the whatever mm -hmm. but who am i mm -hmm. Right. And, and so much of this is like 
it was bred into our schooling that mm -hmm. it's only, you know, that in that's, a way that's the meaning of our life. Those that's the those meaning things. of our life. Yeah. Right. And so, so in this way where I, I see these different lifestyles in the Mediterranean and the, the Okinawa, these blue zones that people meet those later years in a, in a much more graceful way that they continue to like, we don't see enough of our elderly population in the States, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, you know, I, I think I shared this with you where Tom Myers was like, I, I went to go to the hospital to get some of my records for my parents that have deceased and almost everything in the hospital now is death by this death by fa liver failure of this failure of this, that dying is a failure. And it was not necessary it's not necessarily seen like that in other places the dying isn't a failure it doesn't have so you to mean be like a heart heart failure liver yeah. failure. Yeah, that's how we define death the failure that's, of the body yeah, yeah failure of the body yeah but but could it be something that is an evolution to another stage of being uh, mm. you know not actually yeah. in a physical so it and i think you know so the the fear is a real thing in the mm. West, that, that the fear to no, no longer be relevant or no longer that people in, in oh, the prime uh, prime of health. Yes, and, exactly. Yeah. And so we see that dying is a struggle. And when we don't know much about our living, then we don't know much about our dying. And if we don't know much about our dying, we don't know much about our living. I think they go really hand in hand, this, this kind of way of you know, I think in other countries we might see, oh, she she died peacefully in the garden and surrounded by family. But here it might be like it was a struggle in the hospital or it was a failure in the hospital. Yeah, it was a battle. And then they finally it was succumbed. a battle. And yeah. <laughs> people just died before. It didn't have to be a failure. Yeah. So I find this to be really interesting in a way. So when we can live our years and and find ourselves in different stages of living and and find that the rhythm our rhythm may not i i may not have the same energetic quality as i did in my 20s but i'm finding myself at moment by moment in my mid 30s and then my 40s that i can truly live my inner rhythm my mm. biological rhythms that are true to me mm. i can find that i it, 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 I, we slow down but that's mm -hmm. the slowing down also brings some kind of exquisite moment by moment sense that we, that we can enjoy we're, we're less fast so i'm also really interested in circadian rhythm and, and all of this kind of sure well that may be part of your i saw your um uh well, we don't need to get into Huberman, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, we're yeah, learning, learning, a, learning a lot about cir circadian yeah, rhythms. Yeah, circadian uh, rhythms. Andrew Huberman, yeah. 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 So, so Lowen's been also um, just a really, the, in the bioenergetic work, has been really also profoundly important to me in terms of that, you know, the emotional body and, and is, well, is very much. Yeah, important. yeah. Well, just to talk, I guess, talking about Lowen for a second, I, and I feel like, um, uh, you know, I feel like he's somebody who's, who's, who's under, underappreciated. I mean, you know, so, so Alexander Lowen was sort of a successor to Wilhelm Reich was mm -hmm. sort of the, or the guy who, you know, so who was sort of a student of Freud's and then mm -hmm. Reich brought in the concept of, you know, body armor that some of our yes. ego, ego structure from Freud's perspective shows up as muscular tension patterns mm -hmm. in the body. And, and, but then Lowen really ran with that to me, he was such an amazing experimentalist mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the the things that he, you know, uh, tried and, you know, in his clinical work. And, yes. and uh, you know, a way, a point that you and I can, because I don't know many other people who have read all of Alexander Lowen's books, um, except for you. So I was, it was fun <laughs> for me that we connected on that. But anybody listening, go check out, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, shoot i'm trying to remember um what are some of his major titles like the, oh, voice, I like, voice of the I, body yes pleasure is one of my favorites because that that word has such a stigma and the, and the book is so right. exquisite um 
and then there's uh what else are well yeah there's the, yeah there's the voice of the body there's language joy. of the body yeah language the of way, the body joy the weight of vibrant health right there's I, just... I don't know there's probably about a there's probably about a dozen we should we should know yes. the title we should know the titles a little bit better but what's what's so cool is um what I like about them is is how many how many uh sort of clinical stories that are examples. Yes. Um, you know, we're, we're in, and, and, you know, for me as a, you know, I'm a little more than a decade into doing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, body work and, and the related things. And, and, and it's like, you know, I've, I've been a part of a lot of deep processes with people over the years and it's mm -hmm. wonderful. That's what really brings this work alive for me is the kinds of transformation and things that happen with, with the people that I work with. Um, but something that frustrates me is that I all those things happen and, and I I sometimes lose track of them. Like I kind of, you know, they're there in my memory banks, but they're not right there. But, but what I think Lowen did such a great job at is, is really capturing his process around, yes. you know, and he was someone I think who didn't mm -hmm. exactly have a fixed view. I mean, he had a hypothesis, yeah. which is that yes. we need to work with the energies in the body in order to mm -hmm. support vitality, flow, human living. But I don't think he had a totally fixed view. And so, and so what comes through is, is just, um, uh, you know, the stories of transformation, yes. what yes. he learned in a directly experiential way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think anybody who's involved in, in somatic work, Mm -hmm. these days you don't you know maybe we don't have to become bioenergetics therapists because you know yeah. it's his his work still exists that way mm -hmm. but i think that his um simply his writing has so much yes. and it's and, and, a, yes. and it sounds like it really impacted you in a, in that way as well very very much um you know and i think a little bit of you know i think of like the bioenergetic realm and i might even think a little bit of somatic experiencing the work you do where this sure. both of them really touch a, on the emotional life of a person where in Feldenkrais I don't think we're necessarily going there mm -hmm. that that happens but we're not going there necessarily directly Right. It, it can happen, but we're not seeking it out. We're not even really asking about yes. it, particularly somebody might, of course, share. But you're right. Yes. It's 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 present, but it's not the central it's indirect. And that's the yeah. beauty of the method. It's very yeah. indirect. Your your shoulder hurts, but we're going to go to your hip or like. You right. know, there's an indirectness to the method. And and we're like, I think in, in these kind of um, modalities like bioenergetics and somatic experiencing in a way there's the addressing of the body like in bioenergetics there might be like discharge mm -hmm. all right he had like you said there wasn't just one way he was working with people and each story had like a completely complex way of 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 looking but the mm -hmm. the idea of this we in a way, contract or harden these places. And in order to have feeling come back into these places that the, and that there could be this whole circulatory kind of thing is that we we open up the emotion. How it is they get there sometimes could be more rigorous than other times. Right, right. What um, gets to them there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, where from my understanding in, in somatic experiencing, and I've, I've, joined some workshops before and I, I may be interested in actually adding it in, in my tool belt just because mm -hmm. of course like we can't not also address address emotions as they come up and it would be nice to have I think it's very complementary to the Feldenkrais mm -hmm. and so what would you say might be some distinctions there in, in a way but yeah you know they I totally agree with you that they're yeah. complementary yeah. um so many things are complementary, but they really are. Um, you know, I think in, you know, just I, so what I think where Feldenkrais really shines is it's, it's addressing the nervous system, both the voluntary nervous system. And then, and then because of the careful attention to 
refining and developing careful, sensitive awareness of, of movement through the voluntary motor system, it has the effect very much of supporting uh, the parasympathetic nervous system okay. in, uh, in the balancing of our autonomic system, the balance. Okay. And, and so, so, so there's a similarity with with somatic experiencing or with TRE, the, the okay. more explicit goal is how do we create more, how do we optimize the regulation within the autonomic nervous system? Okay. Um, and I don't think that idea was as clearly present during Moshe's time. So he developed a method that very much does that thing of, of helping to uh, create better balance in the autonomic states. Yes. Um, but it, but it, but I, I, I rarely do I see that articulated as the goal in, mm -hmm. in Feldenkrais. W whereas in, in, in somatic experiencing mm -hmm. the, 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 what's being looked at. So the, so we use voluntary movement so that, so mm -hmm. movement is a part of somatic experiencing, but not at all in the careful studied refined way that's mm -hmm. happening in Feldenkrais. But it's, so the, the, the area of interest is more, um, what would influence the, you know, the set point of your autonomic nervous system to move in the direction of uh, uh, greater capacity, more safety, registering mm -hmm. safety, and therefore mm -hmm. more access to our, you know, what's called the ventral vagal nervous system or the social yes. engagement nervous system. So because we have sort of these newer theories, we can be a little more specific around how do we get the autonomic state uh, mm -hmm. to settle. And, 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 and in SC, you're sometimes using movement, but you're sometimes using breath. You're sometimes, yes. which, yes. you know, all, which is in common, which is in common with Feldenkrais. Yeah. But, but where it differs is we're also using uh, uh, a felt sense, which we use in, in, mm -hmm. in, in Feldenkrais, but in SC, we ask a lot more about it. So if I was yes. sitting here with you, Nikki, yeah. I'd say, okay, so you moved your neck a few times. Great. And now, you know, how, what are you sensing? How yeah. was it to move your neck? Maybe you yeah. have some language. And then, mm -hmm. and now what are you noticing? And now what are you noticing? Yes. Oh, yes. tell me a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. So there's this almost like this, uh, this sustained interest in what's mm -hmm. the next mm -hmm. sensation mm -hmm. that arises. And then very much included in SE mm -hmm. is, is, you know, oh, and is there, um, uh, is that an, is that a positive feeling? Is it neutral? Is there an emotional mm -hmm. tone to that? Right. Is there not? If so, bring, bringing curiosity towards the emotional tone. Mm -hmm. Is there a story behind it? Did this remind you of something? Mm -hmm. So that dialoguing piece of it um, yes. is, is present in SE and it's where, you know, in a different way than, than in, in Feldy. Um, mm. But because they're both working with the body and the nervous system, mm. I just see them as being kind of like a hand in glove. Very complimentary. Yeah. 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 Very much. And in a way that like, from what I've observed in, in SC, when I've sat into these, these workshops and seeing them work with different people in terms of bringing them into that time or that kind of traumatic event and then bringing them exactly to their felt sensation and then um, suggesting that there could maybe be another se sensation. But in a way, it brought them a, a resolve that the nervous system doesn't always have to react in that same way when there could be a different way, right? So it's like, in a way with like Feldenkrais, it, it, it's all about the possibilities, right? That there are different possibilities. And um, right, Feldenkrais says, if you only have one way to do something, then it's not learning. You need at least 10 different ways. I'm like, wow, 10 different ways. Like, Right, right. <laughs> yeah, he really challenges us to not be stuck with a Stuck yeah. with a habit, a habit, even if we think that habit works pretty well. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're still limited if it's our only choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. So cool. What have we not, I, I, I feel, what? Well, yeah. What have we not circled on? What should, what do we need to, to, uh, to feel, yeah. complete, to feel complete with our conversation? Well, you know, I would check like, I feel I I feel pretty satisfied. In, in the, <laughs> is that a felt sense? <laughs> it, 
great question. You're right. Yeah. If you feel satisfied, and yeah. if, if you're, if you're being honest, then yes, mm -hmm. I'd say that's a felt sense thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how I feel too. I feel mm -hmm. pretty, I feel pretty satisfied too. And we are what we're a week away from mm -hmm. being in Canada again. So I actually, I'm really valuing this conversation just as a little bit of a warm up um, yes. for, for being in class again for two weeks and, yeah. and getting to do a, another deep dive. Mm -hmm. um, with us and our classmates so um well nikki thank you so very much uh for joining and um yeah this was lovely and and maybe we'll hopefully we'll do it again sometime it's been a pleasure alex thank you very much for having me thanks for listening to today's episode of the redbeard embodiment podcast to learn more visit us at redbeardsomatictherapy.com or send me an email at alex at redbeardsomatictherapy.com. If today's conversation resonated with you, help spread the word by subscribing and sharing with others. Hope to see you next time.